And then we have Mark Taylor. Due diligence, a compliance standard for reasonable, responsible European business. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, that's just the institute where I work. Yeah. Um, and thanks to Beata for the invitation and, and to her colleagues, uh, uh, to Beata and her colleagues for, for the organize, organizing the, the conference. Um, and to all of you who've been working on the project, because when I found out about the project I became, about a little more than a year ago, I became very excited because I felt that the questions, having worked for a number of years in the area of business and human rights, I felt the questions that you were asking were, uh, how shall I put it, refreshingly radical and critical. Um, and uh, in, a, in a field that is, is dominated by a CSR ethic going back two decades, that um, is neither of those things. Um, and also because uh, I've been involved in, in, over the past few years, in two different comparative law projects in the area of human rights and international criminal law. Um, and it's the most recent one that I want to uh, talk to you about. It's uh, this one here. Um, and I'm going to do two things. I'm going to outline uh, a bit about the project and the results and then uh, bring forward a reform proposal that has cropped up in the process of um, updating the project uh, just this year. First, a bit of background, which is um, that the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which were endorsed by the human right, UN Human Rights Council in 2011, um, established, I think most importantly, uh, a new definition of what it means for a business to be responsible, uh, to respect human rights. Um, and that definition has been absent from the CSR debates for the last dec two decades. Um, and it has now been globalized rather rapidly um, through the um, revisions of the uh, OECD guidelines for multi multinational enterprises, which we heard about this morning, um, through the EU CSR strategy, which was also revised to become coherent with the UN guiding principles, um, through the IFC instruments, um, we heard the performance standards, um, and through market mechanisms like revisions of the ISO standards on, on CSR. Um, and they continue to be uh, influential in defining ways that business can respect human rights. So with that in the background, uh, a coalition of, or I should say a coalition of coalitions, a group of, uh, of coalitions, uh, the International Corporate Accountability Roundtable based in Washington, the Canadian version and the European version, um, got together and asked the question, well, if the UN Guiding Principles has defined what it means for um, a business to respect human rights um, and at the same time uh, have reaffirmed what it means for states to protect human rights as the first pillar of the principles. Um, how do these two things connect? Well, the second pillar, this, this one that I've been talking about, the responsibility to respect by a, a human rights, by a business, basically places due diligence at the center of the operational notion of what it means for a business to respect human rights. And so what we set out to do was to ask the question, um, do states use due diligence to encourage or require businesses to respect other standards? Um, if they do so, how do they do so? Uh, what are the compliance strategies, and in particular, how might national uh, legislators use new or existing law to encourage or require human rights due diligence? So we set up a uh, group of experts. Uh, I was one. Uh, professor Anita Ramasastri was another. Uh, professor Olivier de Schutter uh, was another. And Robert Thompson uh, was the fourth. And we held five uh, regional consultations with scholars and practitioners from around the world. Uh, this was during the course of 2012. Um, and we asked them for examples of due diligence in, in legislation or, or regulation or different rules uh, in their um, uh, home countries. And the results um, were um, beyond anything we expected from, from the start. We expected to find a lot. Uh, but we didn't expect to find uh, so much. And we found, it in, we found about 100 examples in about 20 different countries across civil and common law jurisdictions, um, all regions and all levels of, of development, uh, countries from all different regions with all different levels of development. Um, we found it in, in criminal law, in civil law, uh, in administrative law. Um, and so we concluded that, well, due diligence does seem to be commonly used to regulate business behavior. 
but it is dispersed across different legal regimes within all of those different jurisdictions. So it's not something that is um, uh, generalized uh, with respect to uh, business respect. Um, and it's, um, so it is used to protect against different uh, commercial and public interests. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but it is very, very rarely explicitly used for human rights. So there's lots of due diligence in domestic uh, law, but there's not very much due diligence um, uh, with, that's spe specifically linked to the words human rights. Um, the organizations helpfully put this, all of the examples up on the web, uh, so this is where you can find them, um, with various uh, uh, search terms. What you'll find when you click on them is a summary of the, of the, the rule or the law in, in question and with a reference, so you can go to, to read the, the original. I must say that our audience was not legal scholars. The attempt was to encourage, was to provoke you, actually, into proving us wrong. Um, but the audience was very much civil society. That was the constituency that had requested the project. Um, uh, and so we were, we designed, we didn't just put the statutes up, we put summaries of the statutes up. Um, but we do want to encourage uh, legal scholars to engage, and that's why we put these, put these up there, um, is to encourage the debates around um, uh, due diligence. Um, and while I said that they were dispersed across different legal regimes in, um, in these different countries, I think it is fair, what we said in the report is that you can identify, I think, four categories of approaches to the way due diligence is used to encourage or require business to respect a standard set in law. Um, and I'll just very briefly go through those. One is as a binding obligation, either as a statutory requirement or as a form of, of uh, defense. And I think all of you will probably immediately come up with different examples of this, but I'll just give you a couple. One is in um, anti-corruption law, anti-bribery law, both in the United States um, and in other countries. Um, you see different ways that this operates. In uh, the UK, the more recent UK Anti-Bribery Act, you have a specific um, a requirement for due diligence spelled out in the in the law. It's a kind of what I would probably uh, what I would call a kind of strict liability standard with a due diligence defense. Um, uh, in the U.S., under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, it operates differently. You have sentencing guidelines that permit prosecutors to engage with business to identify what the due diligence standards are, and that's a very well established process. In the United States, there's also other due diligence standards in areas of uh, environmental law, quite, quite strong ones. Um, um, and so, you, and, and, uh, so those are, are elements in which you see them both as a, re a statutory requirement and as a defense. We see it in, in um, Canadian labor law, for example, in, in workplace health and safety. Um, the next broad uh, category of, of approach um, is using due diligence as a condition for state support, and we heard a really good um, explanation of this from uh, Camille earlier, where the uh, Norwegian Export Credit Agency uses due diligence um, as the basis, as a requirement or a condition for receiving insurance um, uh, from, from that agency. The third um, was through disclosure mechanisms, um, so disclosing the nature of the due diligence. Um, the, um, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier today, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act provision 1502, which requires companies sourcing uh, minerals from, from DR Congo um, to, uh, to report uh, on their uh, use of conflict minerals. Um, and then the fourth broad area is a combination of these different approaches. So you might, rec you might receive a license for uh, a particular operation on the basis of, um, a basis of an environmental uh, impact assessment, for example, um, and failure to meet certain standards uh, under the same uh, legal regime might be enforced through criminal prosecution for environmental crimes or civil actions uh, on the part of, of um, uh, citizens. Um, I think in general, in all of these cases, there was a dual function for due diligence. So on the one hand, it, I mean, it is a performance standard. It communicates to business um, what is expected behavior in practice in order to meet a standard 
uh, set in law, and it's used at the same time by regulators to assess compliance. And this is actually a, a quite Im important within the field of business and human rights, where both of those issues, in other words, what a business is supposed to do to respect human rights and how governments might require them to do so, have been contested for a number of years. Okay, I have one minute left, so I'm just going to very briefly throw out an example, or I should say a reform proposal, because it's not mine. Um, but uh, two French organizations worked with members of the Assemblée Nationale in, in France to develop something, and it was just been released, as you can see, or just introduced, I should say, to the Assemblée Nationale uh, in November of this year. And it basically proposes to um, uh, re revise the penal and civil and commercial codes to require uh, businesses um, to conduct uh, due diligence. It would amend the French commercial code to require companies to monitor activities they undertake um, that might violate fundamental rights, including through subsidiaries and supply chains, um, and implement measures adjusted uh, to their potential impacts. And it would allow um, for civil and criminal liability to arise from infringements of those rights, both at home and abroad. Um, an extremely interesting uh, uh, proposal, one that I would I put forward here because I think two years ago in the field in which I work, this would have been unthinkable. Um, so even though it may not appear to be radical, um, uh, at, uh, uh, as I say, in the world in which I work, um, it's a, a, an extremely interesting step uh, that it has, it has actually moved to the point of being a, a uh, proposal uh, in law. I think I'll stop there to, in the interest of time. Thank you.